Hi MoFam, how are you? Um, welcome back to my channel, Mo Moon Tarot. Um, today I am going to go for a walk at Terracotta Park and I'm going to take you along with me. I um, have a day off today from work and I thought I, it would be good to get out and get some exercise and um, this is a beautiful park. It's not very sunny today. It's actually really cloudy and overcast. I don't know if it's going to rain, but um, I thought I'd take you along with me and I brought my tarot, uh, a tarot deck with me. So we might draw a card or two uh, or three and talk a little bit about life in general. So if you want to come along with me, stick around and let's do this. So there is a uh, an arena behind me and uh, I just parked the car and I'm starting to walk into the entrance of Terracotta Park. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like. So this is the entrance of Terracotta Park. As you see there are a lot of trees. Of course it's kind of overcast today. It's pretty dark and gloomy but it's a beautiful day to go walking in a forest. Um, I'm living in the Northern Hemisphere in Canada and it's May now, May 2nd. And so the trees are starting to get their leaves, but um, as you can see, there's still a lot of bare branches. So let's do this walk. They put um, mulch on the ground to make a path through this forest. Here we go, terracotta. The Burnham entrance. Somebody's alarm, car alarm is going off. So I hope you're doing well today. I had a few errands I had to run. You know, it's tax season, so getting all my tax um, papers together to get them double checked. Um, and like I said, I'm off work today. I kind of wish I was working today. Someone's coming, so I'm gonna turn off the camera. Just past a group of old men saying, what's the matter you? <laughs> what's the matter you? What's the matter with you? But in an accent, as you see, there's a lot of trees around here so beautiful. My mother loves coming to walk here at Terracotta Park. So I do walk with her here often, but it's rare that I come walking by myself. There we go. Bigger landscape view. So if you are somebody who gets motion sickness, this video is probably going to make you a little queasy <laughs> because I am walking and videotaping at the same time. Yeah, so hopefully if you can't go for a walk in a forest, this video will make you feel like you've had a walk in a forest. Right now it's just an open, uh, open field. That's where we came from. But when we go in, they have little like um, nature. What type of snakes are there in Quebec? And then the answer is here. There are eight snake, eight snake species in Quebec, all of which are part of the Kulu. Brede family. The suborder of serpents includes other families of snakes around the world, such as cobras and vipers. Snakes in the Kalu Brede family, like the brown snake, can be distinguished from other types of snakes thanks to their round pupils, the patch of scales on their head, and the lack of fangs in their jaws. Patch of scales on their head, Lack of things around people's. Cool, cool. So this is all about snakes, actually. What is the brown snake's habitat? 
Unlike other snakes in Quebec, brown snakes like urban areas. They prefer warm concrete to the cool air of forests and wetlands. They are found primarily in wildlands, vacant lots, urban parks, and open spaces. Are brown snakes rare? The brown snake is a very rare reptile in Quebec. It is considered a species likely to be de designated as threatened or vulnerable and is found only in the greater Montreal area. Fortunately, we can find some of these snakes in the Terracotta Natural Park wildlands. How do you identify a brown snake? The snake is less than 35 centimeters long. Thanks to its brown color, it easily blends in with the ground. The two rows of brown spots along its back and the dark areas under its eyes and on its head help to identify it. How do brown snakes reproduce? The brown snake is ovoviparous. Females give birth to young snakes after incubating the eggs in their body. In Quebec, mating takes place in the spring and snakes are born in the summer. There can be a second reproduction period in September. By keeping to the paths, you can help young snakes survive. Are snakes cold-blooded? Snakes are ectothermic. They aren't able to produce their own heat. Like all reptiles, they depend on their environment for warmth. The ambient heat activates their metabolism and allows them to move unlike the human body, which produces heat by moving. What do brown snakes do in winter? In winter, brown snakes gather in the deep holes and huddle together to escape from the cold. These holes are called hibernacula and are usually filled with large rocks and pieces of wood. This is where snakes reproduce and hibernate. In order to pr provide shelter to brown snakes in Terracotta Natural Park, an ar artificial hibernaculum has been installed in the wildland. Two to four meters, French drain, minimum 2.5 meters down. Artificial hibernaculum in Terracotta Natural Park. And the last one we have is, should we be afraid of this type of snake? You shouldn't be afraid of snakes found in Quebec since they are all harmless and are not venomous. But that doesn't mean they won't bite you if they feel threatened. Observe them from a safe distance. That's cool. So I guess that's what they look like there. There's a close up picture. That's cool. I didn't know that snakes hibernated. That's really cool. There's a little bench there. We can take three paths. We can take the path to the right. We can take the middle path. We can take the path to the left. I think, I'm not sure with path, which path to take. I don't think there are gonna be very many people out here today because it's not a sunny day and it does look it's, like it's gonna rain. But um, let's take the middle path. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I didn't know that snakes hibernated. I guess, I don't know, it's something new to me. I don't know much about snakes. I know my friend Wendy, Bone, Wendy Bones knows a lot about um, different types of animals. You can find her here on YouTube, Wendy Bones. She's a tarot reader, so if you like tarot reading, I highly suggest her. She also has a course coming out called Justice Academy, which I'm going to take her tarot course. And um, I'm really excited to learn more about the tarot, because as you may or may not know, I am fairly new to reading the tarot, like I, I started getting into tarot cards when I was in my early 20s and you may or may not know this, I might have discussed it on another video, but I had a colleague that I worked with and 
he and I used to talk French to each other because he couldn't speak English. And that's how I got the chance to practice my French. And so one day he started talking about the tarot. And to be honest, I don't remember ever really hearing about the tarot. What's this? Mysterious wetlands. Wetlands are exceptional ecosystems that ensure the transition between terrestrial and aquatic environments. They are saturated with water or flooded for a sufficiently long period to influence the composition of the vegetation and soil type. In Terracotta Natural Park, there is a treed swamp. Like most treed swamps, it often dries out over the summer. When the area is dry, the growth of characteristic vegetation is the best way to recognize these wetlands. Jack in the pulpit. <laughs> right there, Jack in the pulpit. I guess that's the type of plant that they have here. Spotted jewel weed. Swamp marsh. I'm gonna go this way. So, as I was saying, I so as I was saying I'm going to go the other way <laughs> there's like a group of young um, high school kids yeah so there's some swamp lands in this forest here's like kind of like a body of swampy water I didn't think I was going to encounter anybody in the forest but <laughs> Leave it to teenagers to come walking in the forest together. Something like, I'm, that's something teenagers must, must love to do. You know, getting away from people. Because I find that like, when somebody is a teenager, they actually have a hard time dealing with society. Like that's the way I was when I was a teenager. Like, you know, against all authority. Which, I don't know, like, <clears throat> I wasn't a bad kid, but you know, I had my I had my troubles like any other teenager. But let's get back to the story about um, the tarot. So, um, as I was saying, we started talking about the tarot, and I don't think I had ever really, um, really. Sorry, it's just so beautiful. Um, I don't think I had ever really. Let Let me show you what this looks like. It's really beautiful. See, it's really a forest like they made a path through it but it's really a forest it's a really beautiful forest so as I was saying we started talking about the tarot and he told me that if I wanted to buy myself a tarot deck and draw some cards for myself that he would then if I came back to him with the results of what I drew, excuse me, that he would interpret them for me. And so, excuse me, I actually did do that. I bought myself my first tarot deck, which some people say is a no-no, but at the same time, what was I supposed to do, right? <laughs> Wait for someone to give me a tarot deck? That could never happen. That, that might never happen, right? So listen to the sound of the brook. So yeah, um, that was in my early 20s. And I remember one of the cards I got was the lover's card. And then a few months after I quit working at Costco in the morning, I worked at 4 a.m. in the morning at Costco. And then a few months after I, I did that tarot reading with uh, Benoit, the, the French guy that I worked with, my colleague, um, I actually ended up meeting my partner who I've been with for 16 years now. So uh, that was my first taste of the tarot. And, you know, I, back in those days, I don't really remember tarot being that popular. 
um, like I said, I was in my 20s. Now I'm 40, so um, it's been 20 years, and I think a lot has changed in 20 years as far as tarot reading goes and people reading tarot for others on YouTube and stuff like that. But um, a handful of times after that experience of first drawing my tarot cards, I would every now and then draw tarot cards for myself. But I don't ever really remember reading from a book what the tarot cards meant. Um, I really just feel like it was a feeling that I got within myself of what the cards meant. Like, I mean, obviously, if you see the lover's card, you know it's about love. And, you know, death card, you know, it's about endings. And uh, temperance cards, we know what temperance is. If you know the meaning of temperance, you know it's about patience. And so, you know, I don't even really remember reading what the cards said. All I really remember was seeing the pictures and having this feeling, there's some houses over there, having this feeling that I kind of just inwardly knew what the cards were telling me. And I really want to, that magic that I felt, I really want to allow that magic to come across in my YouTube videos when I do my tarot readings because there's just something so magical about the tarot and you know the cool thing is that it really is all about the pictures right because a picture tells a thousand words and you know like when I read my tarot cards here on YouTube for you guys and girls um, and strangers <laughs> Who, who first just stumble across my channel somehow, you know, like, um, I want that, the, t the magic of the tarot to come through my channel. And I want people who, like yourself, who watch my channel to be like, wow, the tarot is so magical. Like, because it's, it is, it's a magical tool. And like, you know, anybody can pick up a pack of tarot cards and like I did when I was in my 20s and just, feel the magic of the cards and just tap into intuition is such a you know um such a popular word these days but I feel like you just tap into your inner knowing like I don't want to just say you tap into your intuition because what you tap into is your inner knowing you tap into what you already know to be true within yourself because the answers are all within yourself and the cards bring out those answers. And if I can make people who watch my channel fall in love with the tarot, even if they don't buy their own tarot deck, just to feel like there's a magic in coming to someone who is reading the tarot for them or that they want to dive into it themselves. Because tarot, like my friend Wendy Bone said, it really is a healing tool. Um, it really is a healing tool. Here there's a lot of branch um, cut down logs, but so yeah, it's a healing tool and you know, it's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful around. Uh, it's quiet now, so yeah. I don't know, like, like I said, you know, I'm new to the tarot. Like, I only really started picking it up to read it with understanding of the meaning of the cards. I only started doing that like maybe a year ago or so, you know? So like I was saying, I'm really excited to take that course with my friend Wendy Bones, which starts May 10th. And uh, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. and. She knows a lot about the tarot. She's been reading it for over 15 years. And, you know, she knows all the practical meanings of the cards. And um, she can even go deeper into the cards and make them sound so magical and not as practical. I don't know why they're cutting down so many trees here. I don't like it. 
I feel like I'm in a ransacked forest. Somebody, there's like a, some sort of kind of, oh, there's a squirrel. Hi, squirrely. Some sort of, there's some sort of hut built here. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Looks like some sort of teepee or something. And again, there's the marshlands around us. But I'm sorry that there's so many trees cut down. It's kind of sad, isn't it? Like they've actually been physically cut down. I don't remember this looking like this when I went walking last time by myself in here. But when all these trees get their leaves, you know, it's gonna be even more like um, breathtaking. But you see, there's a really well-worn path. Like it's made for people to walk on. Some people bike here, some people jog or run here. But just the amount of trees, like you can tell that it's a forest, right? Because it's this wooded area in the middle of, you know, the city or maybe not the city. It's not really the city. I don't live downtown. I live in more of a neighborhood kind of area. Oh, look, apple blossoms. Apple blossoms. My mother told me about these apple blossoms. She was, um, last time I went walking with her here, she stopped at this apple blossom type tree and she was like, started singing a song. I'll be here in, uh, in apple blossom time. I'll be here to make you mine or something. It was like a song from the 1950s. And pardon me if I can't sing, <laughs> but um, yeah. I'll be here in apple blossom time. I'll be here to make change your name to mine. So that's the best I can do. <laughs> it's beautiful around here. I can hear raindrops falling. Wow. So beautiful. I don't know if you can hear the raindrops falling. The Eastern Screech Owl, Night Owl. The Eastern Screech Owl, Megascopes asio, is a bird of prey that is active at night and therefore difficult to observe in nature. The species lives in forests, groves, orchard and marshes, and also in rural and urban environments. Eastern screech owls have been spotted in Terracotta Natural Park, which is home to abundant prey such as small rodents, mice, rats, squirrels, voles, flying insects, and small birds, and provides many nesting sites, especially in mature trees and standing trees. Master of camouflage. Wow. The eastern screech owl's feathers are gray or reddish brown and resemble the colors of tree bark. When the bird feels threatened, it stretches its body and presses its feathers against the tree to go unnoticed. 
The eastern screech owl's night vision is very well developed and allows the bird to hunt in almost total darkness. Its head can also rotate 270 degrees, which is very practical for hunting. The hooked beak is strong, allowing the owl to carry its prey and tear it into small pieces. The eastern screech owl does not have ears, but tufts. These tufts ex express its mood. When another bird approaches, for example, the tufts, bristles, stand on end together for life. Did you know that Eastern Screech Owls couples stay together for life? The birds have one hatch of two to eight eggs per year and stay in the same nest since the Eastern Screech Owl is a resident species. The birds nests are located in tree cavities such as abandoned, abandoned woodpecker holes and natural cavities that have been widened. The Eastern Screech Owl is one of the only small owls in East Northern North America. It ranges in height from 16 to 25 centimeters and weighs between 120 and 245 grams. In other words, it is about the size of a football. Like other owl species, it has a big head and large eyes. Well, I guess, I guess I'll, um, I mean, I kind of want to bring you with me all the way, but I don't want you to get bored of this video, but, um, I'll show you what this is. the raindrops through the trees. It's a well-maintained forest park. Land to river. The urbanization of the island of Montreal wiped many out many waterways, but the Terracotta stream, which is fed by rainwater, still flows through Terracotta's natural park. Streams in wooded and urban areas are very useful. They replace underground mains, which are expensive to install and maintain. They improve water quality by naturally filtering, filtering rainwater. Water. They provide wildlife with habitats and feeding and resting areas. Red Fox, Water Strider, Cooper's Hawk. I've seen hawks um, flying around here. They're beautiful the way they glide through the sky so effortlessly it seems. Yeah, natural streams.
Oh yeah, I said I was gonna draw a tarot card. I wonder, maybe on the next bench we can draw a tarot card. I don't know how I'm gonna shuffle the cards and hold the... Hold the camera at the same time. I don't really know which way I'm going, to be honest. I know there's paths, but like, I don't know which path is leading me out of here. <laughs> here. I see a tree here. Maybe I can put the, it's like a, a stump here. Okay. I found a tree with a, a little branch sticking out of it so we can I propped up the phone against this tree and I'm sitting on a stump I have my sweet twilight tarot of the sweet twilight tarot of the sweet twilight I wanted to go to the cemetery today and draw a card there in my city, but so let's shuffle the cards. Let's see what the message is. Spirit, spirit of the tarot, spirit of us. Give me a card that I can speak about for my Mo fam today in this terracotta park, beautiful nature where it's raining. I'm surrounded by wildlife, even though I can't see the wildlife right now. I did see a, couple, a, a squirrel, but okay. Let's keep shuffling. I'm going to take the first card when I'm done shuffling now. Okay. Wow, we have the High Priestess. So this card is like a message to me saying that I'm leading my Mo fam into this magical adventure of the forest. And it's also about you tapping into your own high priestess and following your intuition and following, you know, where your spirit is leading you because, you know, I thought I was going to do this video and then I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. It's going to be boring. It's not going to be successful. It's not going to be. And then I was just like, you know what? It's something that I want to do. I want to go for a walk. I want to get some exercise. I want to do it in a place where I'm going to feel like I'm in a magical space. And so I did that. So the high priestess is tapping into your own magic, tapping into your own inner knowing, like I was talking about before with the tarot. And tapping into the unknown, tapping into the subconscious, dig, digging deep within yourself and finding those things within yourself that you didn't think were there. So that's our message for today from the Sweet Twilight Tarot. Sweet Twilight Tarot. Tarot of the Sweet Twilight. All right, let's keep walking. There was a woman doing her exercise in the park here. <laughs> Maybe if I follow her, I'll find my way out. <laughs> One time I went walking with my sister here. We got so frustrated because we couldn't find our way out. I love looking up at the trees and seeing them form like a cathedral around me.
I just saw 111. You know when you're watching time change, digital time? Like right now, I saw 111 on my video to see how long it's taping for. And even though it went from 110 to 111 to 112, it just registered at 111. Like even though it went from one second to the next, it went from 111 to 112. I it, it like registered at 111, okay? 111, angel number. Um, you know, I don't know what all the numbers mean. I'm, I'm new to learning about all this stuff, but I, if I had to guess what 111 would mean, I would, I would think that, it, you know, one is like the number of spirit, like the number of the universe times three. So it's like really being in touch with the universe, really and being in touch with the divine, um, having your crown chakra open, there's a way out, but it's into some other neighborhood. And yeah, just a sec. We have some more information here. Invasive exotic plants. Common reed, Japanese knotweed, glossy buckhorn, European buckhorn. What is an invasive exotic plant? Invasic, invasive exotic plant species are introduced outside their natural area and spread quickly in their new environment. They threaten and even displace the indigenous plant population, populations, modifying wildlife habitats and reshaping entire ecosystems. The industrial development of Terracotta Natural Park led to environmental disturbances that caused invasive species to propagate quickly in certain areas. Various accommodations and interventions are carried out in the park to limit their spread and protect the integrity of the ecosystem. Invasive plant species share characteristics that enable them to spread quickly and efficiently in new environments. They are remarkably adaptable. Their extensive root systems help them grow quickly. They have a high rate of reproduction, i.e. they produce a large amount of seeds and a fruit. They benefit from a lack of natural predators. Stopping the spread. Follow these tips to help limit the spread of invasive exotic plants in natural environments. Do not purchase or plant these species. If an invasive plant species is growing on your property, find out how to get rid of it safely. Do not dispose of yard waste in a natural environment. If you come in contact with invasive species, be sure to clean your clothes and garden tools carefully to avoid spreading seed or fruit. But these look like such beautiful plants though. Common reed, Japanese knotweed, glossy buckhorn, European buckhorn. I don't know guys, I don't really buy it. I don't really buy it. I think that, you know, I mean, sure, like dandelions are weeds, right? So people want to get rid of dandelions, like, because they propagate so quickly because, you know, their, their seeds have little fluffy things that help them to, to fly through the air and to be easily dispersed in large areas. And so people say, oh, dandelions are weeds, let's exterminate them. But like, I don't know. I mean, it's nice to see a green lawn, don't get me wrong. wrong. Like, I'm, I'm all for a green lawn, you know, but like at the same time, this is a forest. Do we really need to limit the spread of wildlife like in the forest? I can understand if a tree is sick and you need to cut it down because you can't heal it and it's gonna spread to, you know, the trees around it. But see, let's see this. Snags or standing dead trees are precious habitat for fauna. Thank you for protecting them. There's a little mushroom. And the woodpeckers peck into this and get, get the bugs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm an Aquarius, so as an Aquarius, I really do feel like I'm open to different opinions and different viewpoints 
So if someone gives me their reasoning as to why, you know, these invasive natural plants shouldn't be allowed to propagate, I might understand what they're saying because I understand a logical argument, but at the same time, I also feel like a forest is meant to be wild. And I mean, it's not like we're planting tulips here in the forest, although I, I wouldn't have any objection to that, but I don't know. It's not like nature, anyways, nature always finds a way to overcome, you know, like even if you try to, I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't such a thing as extin extinction and that certain animals, you know, are in danger of extinction or have been extinct. Um, you know, maybe even the same has happened with plants. I don't know. Like maybe certain plants have become extinct. I don't know enough to say, but it would make sense that if there were animals that have become extinct, that there were all, there would also possibly be certain species of plants that could have been extinct as well. But it's just a beautiful day today. I think the rain has stopped falling. Oh no, I still hear it. It's because I had my hood on my head so I couldn't hear the rain falling. It's really muddy. I just finished shining up my boots, so I don't really want to be stepping in the mud. <laughs> I think we're coming to the end of the end of the walk through the forest. Yeah, so we got the High Priestess card, which to me feels like an affirmation, like drawing a card of following your own inner voice, following your own inner compass, um, tapping into your own inner knowledge, you know, um, following your instinct, following your intuition, following your third eye vision. And when I say your third eye vision, I mean following that part of yourself that sees what you can't actually see with your physical eyes but with what you can see with your third eye, with your crown, you know, what you know with your crown, what you see with your third eye. Speak what you see with your third eye. Speak what you feel with your crown chakra. Allow your chakras to be open. Allow yourself to go into nature and become lost in nature and become one with Mother Earth and really just appreciate her. I know we just celebrated Earth Day and you know, I, didn't, I didn't do anything super special for Earth Day, but at the same time, you know, every day can be a celebration of the Earth. Every day should be a celebration of the Earth. You know, a celebration of our planet, you know? Like they say in that show, Third Rock from the Sun, or our Third Rock from the Sun. And uh, that reminds me that I'm studying an astrology course. And uh, when I get home later, I'm going to review what we've learned so far. Okay. the trucks in the background backing up but uh, I mean it's amazing how you can be in this plethora of beauty trees and nature skies beautiful today and yet you can be in the middle of like a, a rural area you know um, I really do appreciate this forest but I, I usually don't come walking here by myself. 
which is why I thought it would be a good idea to kind of take you with me on this journey. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Um, you know, if you have any questions um, for me as to, um, you know, my life or, you know, my practice or just questions that maybe I can help you answer, you gotta let me know in the comments below. Through the seasons, adapting to the cold. Hawks speed nearly six months. Hawks spend nearly six months in the southern United States before returning to Quebec to nest. Sap flows through the trees and buds emerge. Hawks reproduce discreetly. Their nests are often well hidden in trees. Formidable hunters, hawks feed during the day. Hawks are not adapted to the cold. They follow their prey, small birds, south. Winter, they spend it in the United States. Spring, they reproduce discreetly and their nests are hidden in trees. Summer, they feed during the day and they're hunting. Fall, they're not adapted to the cold so they follow their prey and small birds south in the fall. North to south, when it gets very cold, some birds prefer to migrate to warmer climates climates, rather than endure sub-zero temperatures. Migrating birds accumulate fat reserves and make rest stops to have enough energy to reach their final destination. Over 20 bird species, including the sharp shining hawk, Canada goose, ruby crowned kinglet, blue headed vireo, and several species of hunt buntings and wobblers stop at Terracotta Natural Park during their migration. Interesting. Hibernation or overwintering. The star hibernator is undoubtedly Hi. The star hibernator is undoubtedly the groundhog which goes to sleep in fall and only wakes up in spring. Garter snakes, frogs, and turtles are also steadfast hibernators. Hibernation also has its share of impo imposters. Contrary to popular belief, bears, raccoons, and skunks do not hibernate. They overwinter. Plants use a variety of strategies to build their energy reserves to survive the winter. While perennial plants store reserves in their roots, annuals store, store all their energy in their seeds. Hardwood trees stock reserves in their buds, which grow into leaves in spring. In fall, to prevent old leaves from using up water and energy in winter, maple trees stop the flow of sap. The leaves then change color and eventually fall. Adapting to the cold. When animals hibernate, they become dormant and decrease their metabolism. They slow their heartbeat and breathing, lower their body temperature, and reduce their brain activity. Animals that overwinter find shelter and fall into a light sleep but are not dormant. Oh, so that's overwintering. They find shelter and fall into a light sleep but are not dormant. Interesting. So I believe this is the way out, if I'm not mistaken. When we come to a tall amount of reeds, and it feels like there's a clearing taking place here. So now we're back to where we started. This clearing, this entranceway to the forest. So, it stopped raining. It was raining while we were in the forest. So you may have heard the raindrops falling. So, like I said, feel free to ask me any questions if you want to know a little bit about me. And if it's, you know, a, a decent question or if it's, you know, not too personal, I guess. Um, I'm willing to answer. Um, thank you, MoFam, for coming with me on this walk. Um, please remember to like this video if you found it interesting, if you like this style of video. I mean, I'm obviously not gonna do these videos all the time, but I just thought it would be 
fun and that it would be a nice change from the ordinary. And subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Um, I really appreciate your support. And, um, you know, if you do want to subscribe to my channel and you do, um, of course, there's a little the bell icon that you can click on so that you know when I upload new videos. So let me just show you the bird nest. This bird nest, or maybe a squirrel nest in the trees. Right there, there's one. And over there. It's hard to see, but. So guys and gals, that's it for a walk through the forest on this May 2nd, 2021, on this cloudy day. Um, it's almost nicer going for a walk in the clouds. Um, ooh, I found something here. Oh, it's a sus. The baby lost their sus. That's really nice. My sister just had a baby, which Melody, her name is Melody, and uh, she had her yesterday, and she's seven pounds, eight ounces, I believe. So I'm really happy for her. Congratulations to her. Um, and yeah, so I guess I won't keep you any longer. I hope you enjoy this video. I'm just walking back to my car now, and I'm gonna go home. And uh, I'm happy that you came with me and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.